Thank you so, so much for coming. Um, this is an absolutely fantastic occasion because um, for those of you that aren't aware, we only launched the IMRS branch in, in Manila and in April this year. It was April this year. Um, so to see such an amazing turnout this evening is, is absolutely fantastic. Um, my name is David Kelly um, and I am the Director of Asia Pacific for the IMRS. Um, and we are delighted uh, this evening to bring um, our first prestige lecture um, to the Philippines. Um, but first, I'd like to call Dr. Angelica Bailon to um, provide an invocation for us. Yes, all right. Let us bow our head as we invoke and feel the loving presence of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we adore and honor you. You are indeed the source of all good things and blessings. We praise you for this wonderful night as we gather around for the prestigious Imores Gordon Hodge Memorial Lecture, a first in the Philippines. We are thankful for all those who worked hard and smart to make this event a reality. Thank you, dear God, for the presence of our distinguished speaker, Fimares Bob Maxwell, who, despite his busy schedule, he is with us for this splendid event. We are thankful to our friends, both local and international, making this Imaras occasion truly a global maritime affair, as most especially the Filipino maritime professionals and students, as this forum is conducted for them as a venue for exchange of ideas and fellowship. May they continue to be inspired and be encouraged to be an active member of Imaras with a branch in the Philippines being led by a Filipino in the person of Admiral Eduardo Mar Santos, your admirable son, who you bless to be an admiral, an educator, researcher, advocate, and leader, all rolled into one. With the confidence theme, Ships of the Future, we ask that this be a day of reflection and refreshment, as we listen to our eminent lecturer, Chief Engineer Bob Maxwell. With your guidance, wisdom, and support, Help us accomplish our work and our goals for today. Help us engage in meaningful discussions. Allow us to grow closer as a group and nurture the bonds of maritime community. Fill us with your grace. Lord God, as we make decisions that might affect our personal and professional lives for the enhancement of the maritime industry of which we are a part, be with us because without you we are nothing. Continue to remind us that all that we do here today, all that we accomplish, is for the pursuit of what is good, for the maritime profession, and for the greater honor and glory. This we invoke in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd now like to call Vice um, Admiral Santos um, to uh, just talk a little bit about the Gordon Hodge Memorial Lecture um, and then to introduce our, our speaker. The David Kelly the uh, Director for Asia Pacific of IMRES, our uh, guest speaker, the officers of the uh, Philippine branch of uh, IMRES uh, with us uh, this evening. I greet the uh, marine professionals and especially those who are aspiring to be professionals. I'm truly elated to see that the uh, young people outnumber the senior ones. <laughs> because you are going to be the hope of, uh, of uh, marine engineering and uh, naval architecture. I understand we have uh, students from uh, uh, NAMI, um, Ames, and uh, University of uh, Perpetual Health System. Any other schools? Of course, Ma. Uh, but uh, we're very happy to uh, and elated to, uh, to see you and uh, see your interest uh, in this uh, lecture. Um, so I welcome all, all of you to uh, the Convention Hall of Armasop. It's the Associated Marine Officers and Seamen's Union of the Philippines. It's the largest uh, seafarers union, uh, not only in the region, but uh, in uh, the world as well. And we intend to stay that way with our young people here uh, providing the, uh, providing the uh, the impetus and providing the continuity uh, 
for those who uh, who will uh, pass on towards uh, retirement. Um, we're having the first uh, uh, Gordon Hodge uh, Memorial Lecture. He's a uh, distinguished uh, engineer. Uh, he's done his stint uh, on board ship. He's also taught in uh, in schools from the UK up to Singapore, and uh, he worked in IMO and was a consultant in many of its uh, of its uh, committees and headed some of the committees of uh, the uh, IMO even when it was still IMCO, the International Maritime Consultative um, Organization, and. Uh, uh, he had a total of uh, over 50 years of involvement in EMRS. So I think uh, that's a very difficult uh, record to beat. And uh, the series of lectures which is conducted worldwide, and the first one here in the Philippines, is uh, dedicated in his honor. Tonight, we're indeed very uh, fortunate uh, to have with us uh, Someone who has been uh, in the shipping industry for the last 35 years. Aside from uh, working uh, aboard ship and reaching the uh, rank of the position of chief engineer on board, he successfully tra transitioned to uh, ship management. So, uh, and uh, he's uh, handling uh, 91 uh, vessels uh, at this time. So, again, uh, being uh, an engineer does not uh, limit you to just uh, going, uh, being an engineer or chief engineer of our ship. You can go ashore. There are many opportunities to become technical superintendents, to be instructors, to be teachers, professors, um, and still uh, make a good uh, make good work out of it. Um, he has. Uh, a wide experience in oil and chemical and gas tankers, bulk and container sectors, as well as development and implementation of ship management IT systems. So if you look uh, at the broad spectrum of uh, expertise that our uh, guest speaker tonight uh, has, uh, I'm sure, and I'm certain that all of you will be not only be interested, but you'll also be inspired and hopefully uh, this uh, activity tonight will be very beneficial to you. So, uh, before I formally introduce him, I'd like to re remind everyone that we already have a Philippine branch of EMRS, and uh, uh, which started only this year, and we're already having the second uh, activity now, and we're going to have more activities in the future. So, uh, I would like not only the professionals, the teachers, uh, those who are actually on board as marine engineers, those who are in, ship in management companies, but also the students. I'd like everyone to be involved. We can help one another. We can be better in our, at, our, at what we're doing by being together. Having said that, uh, let me therefore uh, introduce to you our uh, guest speaker for tonight. Uh, Aside from what I've said earlier, he's also uh, a fellow of the Institute of uh, Marine Engineering, Science and Technology, or EMRS, and the Institution of Shipbuilders and Engineers in Scotland. He's also a member of the Singapore Shipping Association, the International Committee. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's uh, give a warm round of applause to uh, our speaker, the Managing Director of Bernard Schulte Ship Management Singapore, Bob Maxwell. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, Admiral, thank you very much for that very, uh, very flattering introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been to uh, Manila a few times over the years. I started coming here when I was, uh, when I was sailing on ships, and uh, now it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be coming back and to, to visit our office here. Uh, the first thing I, I, I thought I'd just recap on, which is something actually Admiral mentioned, I just wanted to, to show this to you, not to, not, not to show off, but to show the people around here, especially the younger guys, that when you start on the shop floor as a cadet on a ship, you know, there, there is a route to get up to the top. It's quite possible 
and if I can do it, I can assure you that uh, there's plenty of people sitting out uh, in the audience tonight who've got a chance to do that as well. The, the subject I was asked to, uh, to speak about originally was uh, how ships of the future are going to be operated and maintained. And that, that's actually something that I'd spoken about before. And it uh, started two or three years ago, uh, the, the initial uh, time that I put something together on that subject. And then when I was talking to the guys in the office, I suddenly realized that times had changed already. These ships are out there already. The changes in the, uh, in the engineering that we all have to deal with, they're already well, well advanced. I mean, I've been ashore for something like 15 years now, and the change since I was last on a ship is, is night and day. So those of you that are at sea, those of you that are teaching people that are going to sea, and those of you that are going to go to sea, you're looking at a completely different outlook to what we looked at a few years ago. And as an industry, we've really got to look closely at making sure that the people that are out there are the right people for the job. Because at the end of the day, the ships are there to make money. If the ships trade economically and safely, then there's jobs for all of us. That's what we need to think about. And it's not how we want the, sh the ships to run or what type of people we want to put on board. It's what's best to achieve that aim, economically and safely. It's a big, big thing. And if we, if we, if we bear that in mind, then we don't need to worry too much about huge policy statements that we all have. Our company's got them. Don't get me wrong, we've got them. But we've, if we keep that, that bit in mind, then all the engineering tasks that we have to do on board the ship, we can put them into perspective. The big question is, where are we going to get these engineers? Now, if we just take numbers, then the Philippines is, is a major source. We've got, and for my company, it's the biggest source by far. Uh, but we've got quite a few other countries as well. But it, it, there's a little bit more to it than, than just where are we going to get them. I'm not talking about countries here. It's how do we get these guys from leaving school up to the level that they can actually do what we want them to do. And if you train them the way I was trained, it's not going to happen. Because those ships are all razor blades. They've gone. And that was it. That was my first ship. It was built in the early 70s. 200,000 tons of ocean going splendor. With a crew of about 30. There were seven engineers on board. I think we had, I think we had three or four cadets as well. Yeah? Uh, she was very automatic, actually, for her, for her age, but it was mainly pneumatic. All the, she was a steamship, all of the steam plant was pneumatic. And when we were at college, we learned wonderful tricks to play with these pneumatic controllers, with bellows here, bellows there. Yeah? They've gone as well. Yeah? They're, they're the, 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 the P plus D bellows are uh, replaced by silicon chips. So, and it's important that everybody in the industry understands that those changes have happened. And the older we get, the more difficult it is to keep remembering that. Because there's still too many people have the opinion, oh well, in my day we used to do it like that. Yeah? Well, we used to do it like that, and sometimes we were quite good at it, but other times we actually weren't all that good at it, to be perfectly honest. Yeah? The, 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 there's a phrase that a colleague of mine uses quite regularly when he says, you know, what is it? The, older, the older we get, the better we were. So, we don't have the British pride to deal with anymore. We've got a different type of ship. This is one of the newer ships down the bottom right that we have in management. It's 9,400 containers on board. She's got a Warsilla nine-cylinder engine, electronic injection control, uh, all the bells and whistles. She hasn't got 
and not scrubber on board, despite what I put up on there. But I put those parts up to illustrate what some people are facing already and all of us are going to be facing in the next few years. And the guys at the bottom end, starting off, they'll see it for the first time. But when we compare it to the older ships and how much extra equipment is on board, it's quite frightening. Yeah? The ballast treatment system. The ballast treatment system on that, that ship is huge. It takes up probably the entire area that you're seated in at the moment, at the front of the engine room. So it's a completely, you know, a, com a complete extra piece of equipment. The, uh, the sub scrubber is a massive piece of kit stuck up in the funnel. Yeah. They've got to deal with fuel changeovers. We never bothered about fuel changeovers. We just changed the change over the diesel as we went into port, but it was no big deal. And uh, you know, nobody measured how much sulfur we, uh, we had on board. In fact, in those days, we didn't even test the fuel. We had no clue how much sulfur we had on board. Now, the shipboard engineers can go into a port, the most recent one that I've, he I've heard of is in Hamburg, and the water police are almost like forensic detectives, making sure that you got that fuel down below 0.1% sulphur. Yeah. That, was a, that was a thing that we never had to bother about. Yeah. And it's coming slowly, 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 and each one of these things has cumulatively added on to what the guys at the sharp end have got to do. That's an old engine room. That was a, uh, a Fiat 900 or diesel engine with nine cylinders and it had every possible mechanical add-on that, that you could wish for. And it managed to push out about 20,000 horsepower. That was it. And it was massive. The container ship I just showed you has got that. Nine cylinders and you're up basically the same size, 9 cylinders, 920 bore engine, you're up at 70,000 kilowatts for the same size, well, it's not even the same size, physically smaller, much, much lighter, yeah? This is what the guys today have to deal with, and we've got to support them, and those of you out there, I mean, support you to be able to handle it, and trying to expect a modern engineer to handle equipment and train them in the way that we did for the old equipment is not possible. You've all got handphones, smartphones, something like that, yeah? And when, the, when that gets delivered, there's a little sticker on the back that says no user serviceable parts inside. We're getting very close to ship large numbers of pieces of equipment on ships being like that now where you can't service it. You, have, you, you, you might have the will to service it, but the, the equipment is getting so complicated that it is very, very difficult for the ship staff to be able to maintain it if we maintain the mentality we did 20, 30, 40 years ago. And we've had the same changes with cars. Uh, I was trying to work out which kind of car would, re would relate to, uh, to the Philippines. Was that the one we have in the UK was the Ford Cortina, which in the 70s and 80s was incredibly popular. And most of us that were cadets about that time, we maintained those ourselves. And you can you see a picture on the left there of the engine. The engine on the right is a Honda VTEC. Most people that own that, the only reason they open the bonnet is to fill the washer bottle. You can't do anything with that as a, as a car owner. You need to take it to the garage to get it sorted out. Yeah? And the ultimate, down in the bottom left there, is the ultimate Honda, if you like, the Honda engine McLaren, which I was fortunate enough to have a, have a close-up uh, look at during the Grand Prix a few weeks ago. The technology in that, which is the technology that's coming next to the road car, is absolutely phenomenal. You, you, would, you would love to, see, to get up close and see something like that. But that's how much it's actually changed on board the ships as well. And we, we really have to, we, we have to realize that. And if we realize that, then we can, we can look at things in a, in a different way. Other things have changed. I mean, 
How many people around the room can still remember what a slide rule was, never mind actually using one? I've got one that sits on my window ledge. Can you remember how to use it? Well done, because I can't. I, I had to read the instructions and I still couldn't get it right. Yeah. It's just so easy now. We've got the calculator, you've got the iPad, you've got the computer. We've moved on. We've moved on to a different, a different league. And it, in detail, I mean, what's changed about the machinery? There's lots changed. And we need to know more about it to be able to handle it properly. As I said earlier, the power is enormous compared to what we were dealing with before. The materials have changed. Efficiency has gone up dramatically, but the tolerances, the room for the error has gone down and down and down because of these wonderful computers. So instead of the designer of the ship or the engine saying, ah, oh, we need to make it 25 mil thick, so let's give it another 10, just in case. We don't have that anymore. It will be 19.5 exactly, because that's what the computer says. So we don't have the room for error, where if we get something slightly wrong, the machine can still take it. The machine can't take it anymore. We've got less crew on board. Obviously, that increases, it, that increases the workload. Now, machines are better, so yes, we should be able to run with, with fewer crew, but it does bring other problems. Machines are better, so we don't need to maintain them so often. And that brings other problems. We've got engines now running 30,000 hours between major overhauls. That's effectively five years, dry dock to dry dock, without pulling a piston out of a two-stroke engine. So where do the guys get the experience to say, oh, you know, we used to pull pistons, yeah, eight to 10 hours, we'd have the piston out, overhaul back in again. Yeah. Maybe didn't do that great a job, to be perfectly honest, but we did it. But we were doing it every couple of weeks, every month or so, so we got the experience to do it. When the ship stopped at sea about two weeks ago, they had to change the piston at sea. It took them 36 hours. Because the guys were working hard, I'm not criticizing them whatsoever. But we had to stand up for them because they'd never done it before. Yeah. So they, it took them a while. It took them a while to find the parts and, the, and, the, and some of the tools. So all of these changes have made serious, serious differences to how we have to behave and how we have to train the engineers. So, as I say, the world has changed, but have we? Have we really changed the way that we educate the guys and girls, my apologies sir, who are going to be on the ships? Not really. We're constrained a bit. Now, we have ideas to change things, but unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, we have the STCW rules, which lay down basics of things that were decided 20, 30, 40, Sometimes longer ago, that were, it's a good idea for the you know for engineers to know about that. Uh, I'm not quite sure if it, I could be corrected here, but I really hope we're still not sketching safety valves. The way you look, I think you possibly could be. Uh, we haven't changed enough. I don't think we've changed enough, and I see it on a day-to-day -day basis with the feedback from from the ships and what the superintendents tell me, and then what the chief engineers tell me when they come through the office. What I think we need now, and going forward, is a different type of seagoing engineering. Now, the people that are out there are quite capable of doing it. They're clever enough to do it. But we've given them, as they've grown up in the system, and as they're still coming into the system, we're still teaching them to be a jack of all trades. Yeah? Be able to, you know, you, you, can, you can maintain a bit, you can run a bit, you can do a bit of paperwork. Yeah? You've got to do it all. Yeah? And if you do it all, you, as I say, certainly on the maintenance side, it becomes very, very difficult to do it right. 
it's also more difficult, really, to operate this, the, the equipment properly. One of the reasons that it's difficult to operate it is, when you go on board a ship, there's no instruction manual. There's instruction manuals for individual machines. Very few ships have a proper description of how all the machinery works together and how, they, how it interacts. I've seen it occasionally. One or two big owner operators used to produce them, but uh, in general, very few and far between. What I think we need going forward are people on board who are very skilled operators. I've heard it so many times in, in the offices, <coughs> in, in owners' offices and managers' offices. These guys now, they're no good, they're just operators. And it's wrong, because I don't think they're trained well enough to be operators. We've let them down. We're still, we're still expecting too much in one direction and not uh, in a direction that we hardly, we hardly use. And, uh, and not giving them the tools to use in the direction that we really need. We need more education, not one-off training courses here, to help the engineers on board and in the office, because they're not scot-free on this, I can assure you, operate the machines properly, like they were designed understand what the limits really are and really mean and how the machinery works together that's an important thing a, a classic example would be a wonderful system with a waste heat boiler on top of a two-stroke diesel but nobody understands what pressure the boiler is supposed to run at and we end up throwing fuel into the boiler because somebody thinks it should be running at nine bar when it was never designed to run at nine bar with the main engine running those things get lost. Yeah? Helping people to understand that type of thing is going to make us huge, huge, it's going to be a huge improvement to how things work. As I say, my education uh, didn't really help me that much to come up that way. There was still the old, we still had the old bangers and the Ford Cortinas around. And just as I started coming ashore, start, things started to power up. Not so much on the automation side at that time. We had a little bit of, it, of extras, the first digital governors and things were, were, were around. Um, whereas now, you don't, you'd hardly see an electro-hydraulic governor anymore. It's all, it, it's all, um, all electronic. Uh, we, need, we need to teach the guys and girls, sorry, a different way or more emphasis on giving them the tools to, to run the modern plan properly. And the, ne the next two slides are there, not to, um, oh, but my idea really was, let's start with basics, because an awful lot of time these days, and those of you that are on ships and around them regularly, will hear everybody goes on about efficiency. But when you actually have a look at what we've taught our engineers, we've not really given them the background to what this is all about. Now, you start from the beginning, but the, you know, the first law of thermodynamics is it's pretty basic. Yeah? Yeah? And the next one, efficiency can never be 100%. And that is really not new. But when we get pressurized to have more and more efficient ships, most of the people that are telling us about it haven't got a clue who Carnot was. And they don't know that, as engineers, we've been working for improved efficiency. Well, before, before 1824, but 1824 was the first time anybody actually wrote it down. Yeah? Um, I'm not suggesting that we turn seagoing engineers back into uh, you know absolute theorists because we 
no matter what, when you're on a ship and there's only four of you, you haven't got time for that. But getting hold of some of those basics and emphasising that they're a bit more important than just we're doing the background before we get on the juicy bit, get the boiler suit on and get the spanners out, is going to help us. Because when it comes down to actually working out if we can run this equipment better or why, then we've got a chance that they'll understand a graph like that. That's the difference in specific fuel consumption with load. And it, from that, you can work out that by running one generator instead of two, at the fuel prices when I did this, which was two or three years ago, yeah, you can save 60 bucks a day on fuel and another 50 on low oil, and then you add on to the practical side how much you're actually going to save on maintenance costs. Yeah. That makes the difference. And the other thing that makes the difference is the machine is then running properly so it doesn't wear out so much in the first place. So there's less maintenance to do. If you run it right, it doesn't break, generally, or it will go an awful lot longer. I really want us to be able to modify the training, mould the guys now so that they've got the tools to get a better handle on these ideas. And understand what we need for the future, for now. The days of the professional third engineer who was really good with the generator but never did any paperwork, never wrote anything down, are gone. Not we would like them to be gone, they are gone. Yeah? If we do a job now, we've got to record what we did. We don't need to be writing a great big long letter about it. Make sure you've got the form, make sure the form is filled in right. So everybody can see what happened, so we know how long it's going to last till the next overhaul. So we know what to buy for next time, we know what to, to, uh, we, we know what to order in time. And you won't have to overhaul it again too early if you record it properly. These are, the, the, these are the things that really, really matter today. Then, less maintenance is less work. It's also less expense, so the ship owner's happier, he'll buy another ship, so there's more jobs for the boys. And girls, sorry. Yeah. So that, that's the sort of mentality I'm trying to get across these, these days. But it, to get that in place, it's gotta be, uh, it's gotta come from both sides, or from many sides. There's no point in colleges changing the way they're teaching people. If the senior officers that are already at sea don't understand what we're trying to do, if the superintendents in the management offices don't understand what we're trying to do, and if the ship owners don't understand what we're trying to do, because you'll always get somebody saying, oh, in our day, or we used to do it like that, and that was fine. Well, we can stay doing it like that if you want, but it's not going to happen, no. It's, it's not going to work. So. It, it, requires, it requires a commitment across the board. Another example of information that I find regularly <coughs> ship staff haven't been given enough information to be able to understand and work on is the, the propulsion, the engine itself. I think most people sort of somewhere remember that there's a propeller curve that's a cubic that goes up quite rapidly. Yeah. But with modern engines and the uh, EEDI rules that have come into place, the engines are so closely matched to the ships now that you can overload these things easily. And what do you get to prevent you doing that? Well, you get this graph that's in the book. Now, the graph is generic, it's all in percentages, there's, not, there's no revs in it or kilowatts in it. No. So you've got to sit down and work out what that means for your ship. Yeah? It's not an easy thing to do, but that's at the moment what we generally still give the ship staff. That, if you're lucky, 
is supposed to be programmed into the digital governor to protect the engine. But because the shipyard wants everything to be okay on the sea trial, they generally leave the limits a little bit on the high side. Yeah? Because it's easy for them. So the limits that you, sh that you should have in place and might expect to be there are not there. And you're very rarely given the information as to how to actually adjust it properly to bring it back to where it, to where it should be. That's a simplified version for a very, very old ship now. But the idea of that was you've got the red line. You, know, you don't cross the red line. If we give people something like that, as opposed to the previous page, we give them a chance to understand what's happening. It's not necessarily perfect, because you can't perfect it in, a, in that shape of graph. But that involves somebody taking the figures from the ship and producing them. You know, it's got to be done basically ship by ship to have something like that to work with. And then they can put, possibly understand how that fits into the control system and the protection system that, that's there. Of course now we've just talked about putting the protection system in place and uh, the whole world should insist that you change fuel regularly. So all the settings that you had that protected your engine quite nicely, when you change on, over onto gas oil to go into the US or into the Baltic, then immediately stop you accelerating when you're uh, in shallow water or in bad weather. So you've got to understand that bit as well. Something else that we have to work on to educate the people out there how to do it better. And I'm going to, I'm going to show you a couple of other pictures now of uh, situations or information that we picked up for ships where the information was available and nobody did anything about it. They've been regularly taking figures for years. The ship was t about 10 years old when I, when I, when I uh, got these, uh, these figures. So even if the info is there, you're still not guaranteed that people are going to do something with it. So again, we have to, we've got to help them to, to actually understand it. But they're uh, basically compression curves from a four-stroke engine. Now, the kink in the middle is not the exhaust valve opening. It's in the wrong place for that, but you know, somebody said to me when I, when I uh, had a look at those, yeah, it's that, that's what's happening, exhaust valve's opening. Said, no, it's wrong. They've been looking at these pictures for 10 years, and nobody took into account the fact there was a, there was a tooth missing on the flywheel. So the sensor wasn't picking it up right, so it wasn't, giving, it wasn't giving them the right shape. They'd be using these pictures for 10 years to balance the engines. Yeah. Really not too clever. So, information's there on some ships. Sometimes, we, I mean, we spend a lot of money on these uh, electronic en engine analyzers, but uh, we've got to give people the, the knowledge to be able to, re to, to read what they're getting out of it. The second one is um, it's a little bit more um, abstract, slightly, in that uh, uh, on the same ship they were uh, they were wrecking exhaust valves and cylinder heads on a regular basis, and then we found out that the temperature was uh, fluctuating dramatically all day, every day, uh, and th th that's, that is one that's one day's run. That was happening every day of the year, pretty much. Again, info that was there that the guys were unable to do anything with. Just quick examples. There are many more out there. But I'm not saying the crew were doing badly there. I'm saying what we, what we hadn't done was give them the tools, give them the background and the education to, uh, to pick up on those things. Because uh, learning to be a fourth engineer grinding compressor valves now, I know it's not as difficult now as it used to be with uh, improved lube oils, but still a lot of time spent doing that. Uh, still people spend a lot of time lapping fuel valves. And 
and expecting them to crack. Right? Total waste of time. You know, absolutely. Just does more damage than good. But we're still doing it. There are people still trying to grind exhaust valves on vibrating ships. We can't do that anymore. The tolerances are too tight. If we run the plant better, we move the major maintenance effectively ashore. It will either be done in dry dock or by riding squads. Because these guys will be doing that type of job every other week. Not asking a chief and a second engineer to do it and they've never seen it done. The best will in the world. How can we expect them to, to, to overhaul a machine where they've never seen it opened up before because it runs for nearly five years? The risk we've got to watch here is though, and I've seen it happen quite regularly, is when we put work squads on ships or jobs are getting done in a dry dock, the ship staff step back from it, say, oh, it's not my problem, somebody else is coming in to do it. That we can't do either. We can't walk away from the job. The guys on board have got to be in it with, with the shoreside guys. So, because they've got, to take, they've got to take possession of it when it comes back into service. So although we'll do the, you know, we'll, we'll, you, will see, you will see more and more maintenance done ashore, the ship staff have still got to be very much involved in it. And they've got to be able to clearly ask what they need to be done. If it's routine maintenance, it should be fairly obvious. But if it's a breakdown, then they need to be clearer. I need this, I need that, I need that, I need those spares, we will need that. So the, the two teams have got to work together. We've got to communicate well, and we've got to communicate better than we do now. It's one of the failings we, ha we have. We're still a little bit, as engineers, uh, abrupt in our communication at times. Yeah? I can be just as bad at it, I know, and it's very easy to drift into that. You suddenly, ex you, you sort of expect the guy at the other end to know what you're talking about. Yeah. So, we've got to be better at asking for help from the ships. And the people ashore that we're sending have got to listen. There's nothing worse, from our point of view, than sending somebody on board and who sends a report back to say, yes, it's broken. Yes, well, we know it's broken because the chief's already told us it was broken. We wanted you to fix it. So, our, um, the pressure on the shoreside service engineers has got to be there as well. They've got to realise it's part of a team. Some companies have got their own teams now. We've started doing that. We've got some guys based in Germany. But it's not as common as it could be. It's not as common as it is going to be. There is no doubt about it that there will be, there will, there will be teams coming out. last part is a little bit about how do we do the training. And we've got to ask ourselves, you know, are we convinced that we need to do it in a different way? I think we do because I, need, I really feel I need to see a different type of engineer coming through for the next, next generation of ships. So that they can so they can survive on them. Yeah? And there's too many people out there, and there's a lot of them, complain about ship's crew. And I hate it. That's the point where I still remember what where I started. The com when you look at the complaints, it's nearly always because we didn't give the guys the tools to do the job. And I don't mean the hammers and spanners. I mean, the information they need, and the time they need, and the encouragement they need. Yeah? In the UK, the cadet training system is based on the 1947 Merchant Navy Training Board. Yeah? It hasn't really changed since then. They accelerated it a little bit, and you got to do it in a shorter period. It hasn't really changed. And to be honest, the rest of the world hasn't really moved that much. 
in the same period. It's changed a bit, and don't get me wrong, I, I understand, you know, the, the Doxford engines have gone and the, you know, we don't see much steam plant anymore and things like that. They, they, so they've been kind of dropped back. But we're, we're, we're still, you know, we're still in, in a bit of a backwater. We, and the, ne the next set of ideas I've got vary a lot, or the applicability varies depending on which country you're in. And I do understand that what we write down that might work for Europe might not work here, might not work in India. You know, so that we, you know, you have to have to take this this bit with a little bit of a pinch of salt. But no other industry takes 17 and 18 year olds and sets them off on a career path to the level that we are expecting our officers on board, engineers and navigators. Yeah, it's not done like that anymore. Big industry doesn't do it. High tech doesn't do it. It's just it just doesn't happen. And it, I'll be honest, I only actually started thinking about this when my own kids got to about the age where they were going to go to go to college or get a job. Prior to that, I thought it was just normal. You know, I started when I was 17. I left school at 17, went to sea, and you know, never looked back. I think. Yeah. So, yeah. As you get older and you start to have you know, children, and in some cases I'm sure there's one or two grandchildren we're talking about here as well, you start to look at it in a different way. And are we doing the best for them? You know? Are we doing the best for them to, 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 to get ahead in the business? Now, the thing is as well, the world has changed and nobody, nobody, I believe in any country in the world, believes in a job for life anymore. I mean, I was sold, go to sea, become a chief engineer after 25 years or something like that, and that will be you till you retire, and that's it. That's it finished. I don't believe any of the younger guys that are that, that are going to see it thought that and believed that when you uh, when when you went. You think yes, you'd like to be chief engineers, but you're not going to stay there. You, know, you, know, you don't want to be you don't want to be crawling around ships' engine rooms when you're 60. You know? So we have to accept that. The seagoing life, the attraction of it has changed, and there's a shorter period that people actually want to do it. And one of the ideas I had was like, you know, let's let's move up, let's 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 let them do their theoretical training first. Go and get a degree in something. You know, something technical, preferably. Not not essential, but preferable. And then we just we'll, then we'll take these guys and give them a year which is not too dissimilar to, to the old system. But let's give them the, the theory theory. One year, going to sea is not difficult. You know? We don't need years and years of experience to, go, to do it. One year crash course, but not a crash course in being an exhaust valve grinder or a compressor uh, valve grinder. You know? Give them the crash course in how the thing works. You know? The little bits and pieces on the side, you'll pick them up. You know? They're actually not that difficult. And then you say, you say to these guys, you're yeah, going to see for 10 years. It's probably enough, isn't it? Maybe 15. Yeah? And then you're going to then that's it. You're going to go ashore, you'll have a family, you'll have had enough by then. You'll be 30, 35, maybe pushing 40, and that's enough. And you're going to go ashore, and you're going to be either a superintendent, or you're going to go into the commercial side. Uh, you know, which bit, there's loads of bits of the industry that are really quite interesting, and you don't have to go on, go on board ships very often. Except that we're not going to get the guys staying for life. Yeah? We train them up to do what we need in an efficient fashion. Some of them won't stay, no, but we've always had that. Some of them, some of them didn't stay. I can remember guys that left during their first year as cadets. No. Other guys finished their cadet time and they they, they disappeared. And you know, uh, of, the, of the people I was at uh, college with, I think it was uh, it was two two or three policemen. One's an insurance surveyor, 
you know, that kind of thing, they all disappeared you know, very, very quickly. So we, we're always going to have wastage, we don't need to worry about that. We need to change our mentality. We need guys that are skilled operators, not particularly maintainers. To operate it, you've got to understand the machine and you've got to understand a reasonable amount of the theory behind, behind what makes it go bang. And that's where I think the education side has, has to change. But it's going, to, it's going to change, there's one last bit to the attitude change, is it's no good coming out as a, as a fourth engineer with the new mentality and thinking that's it. The way things have changed in the time I've been in the, in the business is not going to slow down. So we've got to keep on doing what you guys are actually here tonight as part of with the continuous professional development. It's essential. If we, don't, if we stop, we'll end up in a, uh, end up a, in a, in a, up a blind alley. You know, it's like, oh, I, I stopped learning when I was 25 or 26. It doesn't work. We've got to keep going and working at the new, at the new parts of the, of the job, what the new technology is, what the new mentality is. And it's difficult because you've been at sea. You don't get a lot of time to read into this stuff when you're at sea. And then you come home and you want a break. Yeah? So then the pressure's on. You know, well, you're, you're going to go along to an IMRS lecture. Please do come. Are you going to do a training course? Are you going to do, even do some reading or do a bit of background study yourself? It's difficult because the wives and the girlfriends haven't seen you for ages and, you know, and the boyfriends. You know, they want, it is, the, the, the pressure's on to, uh, to get that time in and actually still have a nice work-life balance, as they say. And for the superintendents, I can assure you, it's as bad. They're working a seven day week with a smartphone. They get home at, they get home at night, you know, nine o'clock at night, then the phone rings and it's the captain from here or the chief engineer from there. And then they turn around to their wives and say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some night school or I'm gonna do some, uh, I'm gonna go out to an IMRS lecture. So it is difficult, we understand that. The guys at IMRS are doing an awful lot of work to try and put more of this online so you can get at it. I think we're actually recording this tonight so uh, any of your friends that uh, have difficulty sleeping, they can watch this. So we're, we're trying with, on the, with the tools to try and make things easier to, to access the information. The IMRS got a lot out there already. The, uh, what's it called, David? The, the t yeah, the TV, and then there's the, the it's not knowledge bank. There's another bit. Virtual library. virtual library, sorry, virtual library, which has got some really, really good stuff in there. So you know, that's worth taking a look at. Um, we've got to, we've got to use those tools, and as managers and ship owners, we've got to understand that we've got to try and help make that time available for uh, all of our staff to uh, continue the development. And that is just a final summary of what IMRS helps significantly to do to, uh, to push forward that development for all of us as engineers. And as I said, I, you know, I'm an engineer first before I started doing all this, uh, all this other stuff. And uh, if something interesting comes up in the office or something interesting is broken, I do try to get involved still, although uh, I, uh, my technical staff try to keep me out of the way, which is a little bit disappointing. So anyway, thank you very much for uh, coming along and listening to my, uh, my mantra on how I think things should be going forward. I hope it's, arrived, uh, I hope it's brought some interest in, and um, if you've got any other questions, uh, either now or later on, then uh, feel free. I'll be more than happy to, to answer questions or to discuss something later on. Thank you. Thank you. I think that was absolutely, absolutely fantastic. I mean, a bit of a whistle-stop tour in terms of 
difference of technologies and how that's changing, uh, the need for more training to understand the technology, um, operating technology properly and, the, and understanding the limits of engineering challenges, understanding the, 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 the complexities of different solutions as well and putting that together and the importance of communication in my engineers I thought was, thought was really interesting from that. Um, um, I think we'll open up the uh, open up the session for a couple of questions. So I, I, I've got one. Yeah. 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 Which is um, you, you said about the importance of knowledge transfer um, at sea. Um, from your perspective um, at Perlin Shorty Ship Management, how 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 do you see knowledge transfer happen on board your vessels? To um, you know, from the really experienced guys and girls that are working on board the vessels to those that are those that are learning. I think it's um, it's got a lot more difficult for the uh, for the staff on board to uh, to transfer the knowledge. Because an awful lot of the knowledge transfer in the past was done during social time, and the the uh, the working environment, the living environment on ships has changed a lot now. Uh, people, are, you know, very much disappear to their cabins uh, after work. Um, and you can understand that, you know, and that's where the, you know, with a lot of ships having, uh, having internet connections, that's where they can get the, the, the entertainment, that's where they can get in contact with, the, with their families. So uh, we find generally that that sort of knowledge transfer that was almost accidental doesn't happen. So therefore, it, it's really up to the, the senior officers to try and make an effort. And of course, they've got their day jobs to do, so they, you know, they're quite tired themselves. So uh, they, they, um, the good guys are very good at it, uh, but we, we do find that it's a, it, it's a struggle for them to, uh, to actually achieve it to, uh, in a consistent fashion. Does that place more importance on CPD as you sort of, as you sort of conclude your presentation as well? Like, you know, that, that, to me, highlight, really highlights that for you. Yeah, I mean, you've got to, I think it's almost like a scattergun uh, technique you now. You've got to put so many things out there so people can pick up the information wherever. Whether it's what's on an app, I mean, there's lots of good apps for certain uh, for certain things, especially procedural ones. Not so much uh, um, the out there engineering side. Uh, the um, uh, computer-based training courses that we uh, that, that we run on board and uh, and ashore. So the, yeah, it's, it's trying to use everything that's there to uh, to get the message across. Thank you. Any questions from the floor? Uh, thank you very much for your uh, excellent insight and presentation. Uh, my question is, um, or rather, I have noted in your presentation that uh, you said that we need different skills from our engineers. As an eminent uh, chief engineer, I would like to know from you, you have suggested the different skills that our engineers should possess. And it's, uh, I think we need to give them a lot more uh, education on the, the way the machinery works and to, to, to start with that actually means boosting up the, uh, the out and out academic level of you know, the, I'm not talking about going deep deep but thermodynamics may be a boring subject, but honestly, yeah, <laughs> uh, I used to think that as well, I would, you know, I know I wish I'd listened, yeah, but things like, you know, things like that, there are parts of those subjects that will really help, and if you take the example of the propeller curve, <coughs> good training to understand how that actually affects the engine ownership and how that how it behaves will make a huge, huge difference. Because then you don't overload it, then you don't break it, then you don't have to open it up. But the, I, can, I can honestly tell you, and this doesn't apply to us, this is not one nationality, this is not one age group. The lack of knowledge in some of those aspects, especially the, uh, the, the whole propeller matching side of things, it's, it's quite frightening at times. Yeah. So I, I, I really think, you know, as, as engineers, we've got to get the basics right, and that does mean we've got to do the difficult stuff first, 
before we do the fun stuff. Any more questions? Good evening, sir. My name is Ted Soha from Mao. Uh, you mentioned in your uh, lecture that uh, we should be producing the junior engineers rather than just uh, OICs or something. Uh, and uh, at present, you said and mentioned called SDCW. Uh, there's a separation between the two uh, levels, uh, which we always say the management level. <coughs> My question uh, uh, refers that uh, maritime higher education should actually give the management skills or the basic management skills so that they can see to what you're saying to be able to interpret uh, those diagrams that you've shown. Uh, so that they relate it to the operation of the machineries to be able to do a report and the importance of the report. Uh, but it is not stated in the SDC level that these are going to be done, not necessarily even in the dependency. So, uh, what are the skills that was mentioned by Dr. Bayon? Are those the soft skills needed by management? It's the skills that are needed by an engineer with a capital E. Yeah. And, and I understand what you're saying because the management level thing comes in the SDCW and uh, I think it clouds an issue. I don't, think it's, I, don't, I don't think we should be seeing those things as actual management skills. They are the basic skills that are real engineers. And, and it should be emphasized in that way. And, that, and we, need to, we need to try and work to get that that message across and I know there's a problem because getting that across because we've got the inbuilt uh, rules of, of already it makes it difficult to get that across but there, there's um, those, those, those things to me are key because we can do the other stuff the other stuff is relatively easy yeah, yeah. and you know if we want some if we want people on board, on board who are good welders good fitters we can get them and we we'll use them when we need them and then we'll go ashore or we'll go off another ship. The people we need to really understand the operating, operation of the ship are the engineers and the navigating officers. And although you know, I'm an engineer and I, I, I always come from that, uh, that, that angle myself, we actually have the same issues on the depth side as we do in the engine. You know, it's, it's slightly different, but uh, the, the emphasis on, on, on running things properly and understanding you know, how they run is, um, is key. And it's, it's very, very important to get that right. Thank you very much. Uh, my second question. Uh, you mentioned we don't, uh, we don't want them to make, to make the mechanics teachers and uh, uh, this, this uh, normally because we can easily get them from our workers or from the meters or the machines that we actually have. You also mentioned in your uh, lecture that most companies are already bringing in a company program to upgrade overall, maybe the, the main engine and so on, so that it does not fatigue the engine crew with regards to uh, and But there was a problem that sometimes this shore based crew does not listen to the chief engine on board and so on. Do you see this kind of trend? Uh, because I feel personally as a ship manager that you are, that it will be more cost effective doing it that way instead of the typical uh, 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 48 hours or more that the engine crew would actually spend in overhauling the main engine in such a manner that. Uh, 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 it will be cheaper using a shotgun. Uh, uh, you, you did not give that much for that, otherwise it's become a certain song. In the long run, it's cheaper. Now, to pay for the shotgun to go on board is, say, a fixed price. And that, that's, that is an extra cost. But you have two advantages. One, 
the, the crew can do other things because in many cases they still have the ship to operate. So they've got the, they, they, they don't have to do the hard labor on that, on that job. But also, because you're getting a job done by somebody who's doing that job every week, they do it faster and they do it better. And they know all the little things to look for. But there is no way your average chief engineer and second engineer can ever know. No, even, if, even the 60 year old who's been at it for years and is really, really good, there is no way, with especially modern machines, that he can have that broad knowledge of the different types. So, yeah, they, uh, it will be cheaper. It will be cheaper for the, uh, there will be less breakdowns after maintenance, the maintenance will last longer, and the, uh, the crew will, you know, there will be some pressure taken off. Not too much pressure taken off, because as I said, we want them to understand what's happening so that they can still, on a dark and stormy night, do so, an emergency. Yeah. So, do you see some of the requirement of STCW uh, for marine engineering? Uh, to remove the uh, function trees for the maintenance and repair, uh, maybe uh, how we call it to reduce the requirements and competence in that area because uh, <coughs> you just need some kind of uh, uh, training or education in maintenance so that you the, the smaller things that you can do, but the major yeah. uh, maintenance and repair will be done by Shaw. Uh, yeah, I think I, I think we've got I think we've got to move that emphasis. So we can't take it away completely, but we're going to change the emphasis. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Probably got time for the final question. If we, if we uh, well, good evening, sir. I'm TV here for you. Uh, talking pro experience, I've been taking it for more than 10 years. Uh, you have uh, a specific term on, as I can see, it is called a perfect machine. Mm. Well, uh, a perfect machine, of course, at times, during the open sea, the open sea at times, something goes wrong. It's just like a human being. If you have a perfect cat, there's no problem, but at times you get sick. So if you're at the middle of the sea, and you are expecting a shore to do it, how, do, how, how is the ship in there? Uh, of course, I uh, do it to, to bring that ship to the yeah. Uh, shore. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you, but almost in a half to have a, a level of confidence where a repair can be done. But the number of repairs should go down. Yeah? It is, it, the, 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 better the, the better the maintenance is done, the number of repairs should go down. But you're, you're absolutely right. There will, be, there will be the cases where it does go wrong. Yeah, like, yeah, if it's a generator, it's okay, we've got another one. Yeah, okay. right? yeah? If it's a main engine, something has, has to be done. But, I mean, with a, uh, with a, with a modern main engine, if you want to stop the injection on one unit because it's a problem, yeah. Yeah, you don't want to keep it. You don't go out onto the engine and, and lift the fuel pump anymore. So things have changed in that respect as well. But, I mean, we've all done it, and I'm sure you know, I mean, keeping fuel pumps around and fits in the you know, with the, with the ship rolling. Yes, we will always need to have a, a level of competence to be able to, right. to do these things. But what I'm saying is we have to move the emphasis to things that we do need more of now, so that hopefully we'll have less and less incidents. But yeah, the, 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 we're so, we'll never have the perfect yeah, equipment. Well, yeah, and that's, um, that's probably why we'll never see the, uh, the completely unmanned ship. Uh, my final question here with uh, you said that education is very important, right? It's right that education is very important. However, we need experience. I observe that there are many educated people, but they don't know how to pay. So, education and experience is very important in this kind of profession. Uh, you have mentioned that uh, it's, we are not skilled operators nor maintainers, but we need, we need to give them the tools. So, as I mentioned, you, you stick on the education. How about the experience, as I said? Experience is very important if uh, being an engineer. Uh, if yeah. you are highly educated on the, on the academic part, I don't think if you are not experienced, you, you know how to create a person. So, it goes together. The problem we have at the moment is that we haven't got either. Yeah. So, 
in the numbers we need. We've got too many people out there who have, um, I don't know if you've heard the expression, you can have 20 years of experience or you can have one year of experience 20 times. Um, unfortunately, we have, we're, we're caught between the two at the moment. We've got, there are good guys out there, don't get me wrong, uh, and doing a great job, but uh, with, the, with the changes that are happening, we've got to give them a better grounding. And if we give them the, I'm not talking about going super academic here, but if we give them the right type of training to start, they will then pick up the experience that they need faster. Yeah, okay. You know, so we, we, we uh, okay. it's not, it's, I'm not, I, I'm not, I, I'm not replacing a chief engineer with a scientist. You know, okay, it's, well, it's, sorry, yeah, we're going to the experience in the school education. Yeah. Experience yeah. and education. Yeah. It's, it's, get, it's getting the education where you spend the experience for a lot of time. You need both. You need both. Okay, thank you so much. Sir. I think there was one last question to say, but it's just interesting. <coughs> Good evening. Um, I am speaking for the Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering students. Um, as we all know, Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering is involved with the design uh, aspects of the ships. Uh, what particular advice could you give us, uh, young and aspiring professionals, um, in order in order for us to be an efficient designer when it comes to the machineries? When it comes to designing, the biggest problem we find is that two designers don't talk to each other. <laughs> we have some, we have, we have engine rooms full of wonderful equipment, but they don't actually match. So there's a, there's a holistic, and there's a holistic view of the uh, of the ship's design that I don't think we're getting right. You see it if you see a ship that's built. Um, one of the big owner operators, but there are very few ships in the world that are actually built by them. Although you know, you know we've all seen big blue and we know about them. But, uh, ships that are built by shipyards tend, as the as the designs get older, actually get worse because there are changes made that they don't they don't think through. So actually, yeah, for, from a design point of view. Try and look at it all as one and, and, and think about how the guys are going to have to operate it. Because they have to, they have to operate all, all the equipment at once. I think that's, uh, that, that would be the biggest, uh, the biggest thing that um, would help us all. But the, the, the other thing I would, I would like to point out, just when you mentioned naval architecture, because uh, it's, a, it's a big thing on our side as well, is that we see Marine engineering and naval architecture really working together as time as, and as time goes on. Uh, as a company, we're now, we now look at taking on naval architects and, and electrical engineers and mechanical engineers separately. So they, um, <coughs> our, our days as a, as a shore based organisation of looking at uh, ex chief engineers and ex masters as the only people that are going to populate the office are. Over. So we're, we're, we're very much looking at the, at the expertise from the whole industry and making the most of that to, uh, uh, to support us uh, in managing ships. Uh, my final question is, uh, does DSM offer um, internship programs for students? Yes. We, in uh, Singapore, we take on three to four interns every year. And we also have a training program for non seagoing uh, technical staff to bring them into the system as well. So, uh, what are the requirements? I don't have a website or. You could have it in Singapore first, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's a fact of life. Uh, uh, the uh, last year, the. Um, we took on three last year, ran them all summer. One was a mechanical engineer, one was electrical, and one was a naval architect who was thinking about changing to the engineer. Uh, we're looking at people on degree courses, uh, usually second or third year. And uh, yeah, you know, 
but we will continue to do that in certainly in Singapore. I can't speak for the other offices because geographically it, it makes a difference in how they operate. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to call the person of our, of our branch now to uh, Apple Santa to uh, sum up with people who are voting. I think we've got something like this week as well. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, I guess that was a uh, that was a very stimulating and interesting uh, 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 lecture tonight. Um, what do you get out of this? Uh, I think if you you can summarize it in a, one or two words. Uh, everybody needs passion. If you have passion for your job, then you will do research. You will look at you make records of what you're supposed to do and uh, you really don't need to be to take up uh, management subjects to learn how to uh, uh, to get the uh, area under the curve uh, so it really takes passion for you to to, uh, to to get moving to be able to communicate and I guess for the young uh, young uh, for the young aspiring professionals here the thirst for learning and passion is something that's really needed because as years go on and as clearly and repeatedly stated by our, uh, by our uh, guest speaker, as years go on they keep relaxing and forgetting and in the end everything becomes so routine that uh, just following the, uh, what is stated in the box as uh, supposed to be the uh, which is supposed to be the, the instruction for the maintenance. It's not even being followed. It's not being written there in the box. What are you supposed to do? If you look at the, at the maintenance manual, whether it is uh, a board sheet or whether it is in the schools or whether uh, it is uh, in the different shops. You look at the manual, they are not following it. And it's right there, clearly stated uh, what you're supposed to do. So, again, all you need to do is read, understand, think, and be passionate about what you're doing. And as our guest speaker said, he's an engineer with a letter, capital letter E. So that means that before anything else, he thinks he's an engineer and, uh, and he tries to, uh, to make do with what's, uh, what's happening. So, I guess that's in for everybody. And finally, let me say that that's what Emirates is for, to provide continuing professional development. And you've, you've heard so many things about available uh, resources, available materials, uh, Emirates TV, uh, virtual library. It's all available for us. Uh, it's just a matter of being passionate enough to open up, uh, to log on to, uh, to the web page, look at what is there, be interested in it, and it's all there for everybody to, uh, to take advantage of. And so I think we're all very lucky that, uh, that we have had our first uh, 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 lecture on, uh, for EMRS. I assure you that we will continue doing this. I hope that when we uh, send the invitations, we'll all be there. And I hope that when we have uh, interactions like this, everybody participates because you learn out of the interaction that happens. I assure you that uh, uh, there will be continuing uh, activities like this in the coming months and years. And uh, what we need is your presence, your interest, and your passion in doing the correct thing. Having said that, and it goes. Let me uh, let me thank uh, Bob for a certain outstanding uh, uh, talk, uh, and I hope that he has motivated all of you. And uh, of course, after listening, that they also take internship. <laughs> I hope too, that we interest the students uh, uh, and uh, motivate them to study harder, so that uh, they can earn their internships. Um, and so. Uh, I'd like to request uh, David to help me in presenting this certificate.
Oh, we read the same thing together. At this time, Chair, um, the, 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 the executive request address and us and uh, Mr. David Kelly to award the certificate of recognition to our eminent lecturer and the certificate reads as the Institute of Marine Engineering Science and Technology awards this certificate of recognition to Robert Maxwell, Chief Engineer CMRE, FIMARES, FIES, Managing Director, Bernard Schott, Ship Management, Singapore in greater recognition for his significant contribution as a speaker during the Timores Gordon Hodge Memorial Lecture, how ships of the future will be operated and maintained, and how will he train the engineers to do it. Organized by the Timores Asia Pacific in cooperation with the Timores Philippine Branch, and sponsored by the Associated Marine Officers and Seamen's Union of the Philippines, awarded this 24th day of November at the Amazon Convention Hall, signed Vice Admiral Eduardo Mar Santos, President Imares Philippine Branch, and David Kelly, Director Imares, Director of Asia Pacific.